My name is Carla Thorson. I'm Senior Vice President for Programs here at World Affairs. And welcome to our second program in our Elections 2020 series. Um, until Election Day, we'll be holding a series of virtual conversations on key issues affecting our democracy, like housing, healthcare, disinformation, and the role of the media, along with key global policy challenges like climate change and the changing US role in the world and our relations with key countries and regions. Today, we're gonna to focus on the Middle East and we're glad that you're all so eager to join us and learn more about these pressing issues both at home and abroad before casting your vote this November. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Rundell, former chief of mission at the American Embassy in Riyadh. And moderating today's conversation is Deb Amos, NPR correspondent. David Rundell served as American diplomat for 30 years in Washington, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates. Widely regarded as one of America's leading experts on Saudi Arabia, he spent 15 years in the country where he worked at the embassy in Riyadh, as well as the consulates in Jeddah and Dahran. We encourage you to purchase his new book, Vision and or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads, which was released today. And Deb Amos covers the Middle East for NPR News and is reporting on refugee resettlement and immigration in the US. Her reports can be heard on NPR's award-winning Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. And she also teaches migration reporting at Princeton University in the fall term. So welcome to you both again, and welcome to everyone who's joining us. And I will let Deb take it from here. And David, you can start your answer again. I can answer the question again. I'll be quicker this time. So we've practiced this question and we shall, yeah. we shall do it again. And the question is, and I'm sorry for all of you who couldn't hear us, but here is the question. We saw uh, a remarkable uh, thing on, on television, the Abraham Accords. Uh, uh, for the first time, the UAE and Israel uh, have signed an accord. It's a big deal, not a peace deal. Um, the missing player, of course, was Saudi Arabia, although we know that Saudi has back channel relations in the way that the UAE had them with Israel. The Saudis have allowed, um, have opened their airspace for the first time for uh, is Israel to fly to Dubai where you live. Um, and I wondered if there's a timeline for the Saudis. Are they out uh, for good or is there something that has to happen for them to sign on to this? Well, I think there are a couple of answers there. The First answer is that the Saudis are a status quo power and they want to have peace and stability in the Middle East because they have a lot to lose. They actually like things the way they are. So anything that rocks the boat, whether it's Nas Arab nationalism from Nasser or bin Laden and his jihad or the Arab Spring or the Arab-Israeli dispute is something that they would like to see resolved. So they have a long standing interest in getting this thing resolved and they have tried more than once to do that. The previous two kings, King Fahad and King Abdullah, both proposed peace plans, which um, pushed the Arabs as far as they could at that time towards an acceptance of uh, some sort of a two state solution. Um, so the Saudis have an interest, a long standing interest in resolving this problem. The immediacy of wanting to solve the problem has grown because the cost to them of not having relations with Israel has increased. That is to say, their lack of trade, their lack of tourism, their lack of investment opportunities, the, these, these economic opportunity costs have become greater, particularly as a result of the COVID, which has damaged the Saudi economy. So at the same time, the, um, if you will, the benefits of not having a relationship have gone down. Uh, the older generation still gets a lot of psychic value from being part of the Arab nationalist movement, of uh, feeling sympathy for the Saudi, for the, for, the, for the Palestinians, but the younger people do not share that. Um, I've talked to a lot of them and most people under 30, they say, you know, I'd like to go to Israel. I'd like to go there. I'd like to see it. I'd like to be trading with them. I'd like to do business with them. Um, and they, and this may sound harsh to some ears, but it's what I hear is that they say, you know, look, these guys have not been able to solve this problem. 
uh, we can't solve it for them. We, it's, the cost of this are too much for us now, and we, we don't want to be. And also, they blame the Palestinians. They say the Palestinians weren't all that grateful to us. We, they backed Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War against us. So anyway, there's less sympathy there than you might expect, and people are willing to um, reevaluate the cost benefit. The other things which you clearly would know about, obviously, they are the fact that the Saudis feel threatened. The Saudis do feel threatened by Iran. And increasingly, they feel threatened by the Islamists, um, which are a collection of Muslim Brotherhood sympathetic movements and governments, uh, one of which happens to be Turkey. And I think if you talk to some people in Israel, they will tell you that they see uh, Turkish expansion, certainly into Syria, as much, of a, as much of a threat as, and maybe more of a threat, because the Turks are a lot closer to them than the Iranians. And then the final feature that I think would move the Saudis is their desire to maintain a close relationship with the United States. Uh, they depend on the United States for their security. Uh, that hasn't changed. And they need to have a good relationship with whoever's in the White House. And they believe that, uh, they understand that we would like to see this problem. And they've had, every time we've tried to do something, they've usually, and not almost always, they supported our efforts. Um, now, you, the bottom line is, are they going to get out in front? Um, and I would say there that they are not going to get out in front. They are going to wait for a consensus. They would be more than happy to, happy to create that census, either through the Arab League or through the Muslim World League. Um, but they are not going to give their enemies, uh, which is the Iranians and the Islamists, uh, the forces, if you will, the factions in the Middle East that oppose them. They don't want to give them a stick to beat them over the head by saying you're that you just betrayed all the Palestinians. So they will wait for a consensus. But I think in the meantime, and that's before they make a, an, an overt uh, gesture but in, uh, to um, normalize relations. But in the interim, they are taking a lot of incremental steps like you mentioned. Um, you talked about the overflights, which haven't happened in 70 years, and now they're happening. Uh, there was a TV show, which you probably know about, The Mother of Aaron, TV show that appeared on Saudi television, where there was, a, it was about a Jewish family in the Arab world, and they were actually talking Hebrew on Saudi television. That certainly wouldn't have happened five years ago. And to me, one of the more interesting things was the fact that the former justice minister of Saudi Arabia, a religious figure in Saudi Arabia, the justice minister is a religious sheikh. Uh, this fellow, uh, now the head of the Muslim World League, uh, went to Auschwitz for the uh, anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and made a number of speeches denouncing Holocaust deniers. That's a big change for coming out of Saudi Arabia. So I think the evidence is clear of where they want to go. They're just pushing to get a consensus so they are not out in front and, and hit over the head by the people who are their opponents. The, the two generations that you mentioned, the 60-year-olds versus the 30-year-olds, perfectly describes the generation between the king and the crown prince. Yes. And we've seen in the past that when uh, Mohammed bin Salman gets a little too far ahead on the Palestinian issue, that the king makes uh, an unexpected appearance and pulls it back. And so I think my question is, I have read uh, the people say they won't make, um, they, they won't have the same relations with the Israelis until the king dies. And I wondered if, if you thought that it would be that long, if, if it is the king who can't quite bring himself to do this um, or something else has to happen. And I think you nailed it. I think that the king, the king is, you know, he's not 60, he's 80. He's very much from the generation that it's in his DNA, if you will, that um, you have to support the Palestinians, that it's an abandonment of the Palestinians. And so I, you know, there have been a lot of surprises in Saudi Arabia, so you never say never, but I would be surprised if the king um, changed his mind, unless something happened. I mean, the king, the king has said very clearly he's happy to recognize Israel if a few things happen, if there is some kind of a settlement that the Palestinians are happy with, if they get some kind of a state, uh, probably if there's some kind of resolution for the refugee problem. These are issues which have been on the table for a long time. So the king is not saying, I don't want to deal with the Israelis. He's saying that we have a plan. These are the commitments that we'd like to see. And if those are met, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have peace. And I don't, I don't see him abandoning those in the near future, no.
Let me come back to the son, um, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, usually known as MBS. There was a letter uh, written this, uh, that was published this morning in the Financial Times. Uh, Malcolm Rifkin wrote it. He's a former, yes, yes. former UK defense uh, and a foreign minister. And he writes, once again, Mohammed bin Salman's unpredictable behavior is becoming a cause for concern. This is not about Jamal Khashoggi, but it's about Mohammed bin Nayef and Saad al-Jabri. Mm -hmm. um, MBS is now bearing down on these two men, both who had high and, and powerful positions in the government. Um, and it is causing concern in Western capitals. The State Department, in a rare rebuke to the Saudis, uh, were, you know, have, have, have defended both of these men. Why do you think this is such a big deal for, for MBS? He knows that Western capitals don't like this. They were, um, they felt an alliance, certainly with Mohammed bin Nayef. He uh, did a lot uh, to quell Al-Qaeda in the kingdom and was a partner with intelligence. Why is he after these two men in, in ways that could annoy his allies? That's a good question. Um, I think in, in the Rifkin editorial or op-ed, um, he was clear that Mohammed bin Salman is doing a lot of things right and that, he's, that he, is, he is making progress on reforms. And it was more in sorrow than anger that he, the headline was a little misleading, I thought, after I read the article. But because he, he acknowledged that the guy has done a lot of things right. But you're right, again, that some of the things he's done wrong um, relate to some, one of his shortcomings. And I would have to say, I think this is a shortcoming and you identified it. And that is he is tone deaf to a foreign reaction. And there are many people who liken him to his grandfather. And in many ways that is true. His grandfather was bold, aggressive, uh, decisive, uh, charismatic. Uh, but his grandfather was much closer attuned to foreign reaction. I'll just give you an example. When he conquered uh, the Hejaz and took over Jidda, uh, all of his generals were encouraging him just to storm the city and sack the city, as he had done in other places. And he said, no, we can't do that, because in Jidda, there are foreigners, there are Westerners, there are Western consulates, there are Muslims from other countries. If we sack the city, we're going to get bad press. And he, and he really said that, and it was well recorded that that was his thinking. So he was sensitive to what reaction, and this was, you know, 1926, a long time ago, that he was sensitive to that. His grandson, and I think that's a shortcoming, does not seem to be as sensitive. So yes, I think that the Malcolm Rifkin identified a problem that we should uh, try to counsel this uh, crown prince that he should be more aware of. Um, I also think I'd just throw it in that, you know, I know both of those people very well, uh, Saddle Jabri and, uh, Mohammed bin uh, Nayef, and I think that uh, we're doing the right thing to um, protect them and try and defend them because they did a lot to help the West, and we do owe them something, and that's a fact. So, they saved American lives. You know, it raises the question, um, all of those who, you know, let him off the hook for what happened to Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, um, who defended him and said it wasn't really him, um, and had hoped that he'd learned a lesson. Um, and it raises the question, did he? And in fact, we have a question from our audience from Claude Esran. How should the US deal with MBS given his role in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? Should we shun him or welcome him in the US and at international meetings? I, I, it always goes back to that. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I think, you know, what was the name of the person who asked that question? Odd Esran. Odd. Well, um, he asked, I think, the most important question of the evening. I think that is the central question that we have to talk about tonight. Um, and it is a question that those of us who deal with Saudi Arabia with have wrestled with for two years. It reflects one of the central tensions in American foreign policy. And that is a conflict, a permanent conflict between promoting our values and protecting our interests. And any policy that exclusively focuses on one of the two is going to fail. If we abandon our values, we have nothing to defend. 
if we abandon our interests, we have nothing to defend our values with. So I think that um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi was a crime. It cannot go unpunished. It cannot be repeated. At the same time, we have strong mutual interests with the Saudis that go beyond just oil, which may be less important for us today, but it remains critical to some of our allies, notably Japan and Korea. Uh, Counterterrorism, where the Saudis have been very helpful over the last 20 years. And as we just talked, uh, their behind the scene quiet efforts to solve the Arab-Israeli problem. Um, I think it's also true to say that um, our efforts to bring about regime change in the Arab world, in many cases, have not been successful. That if the Saudi regime were replaced through elections, the most likely winners would be some version of the Muslim Brotherhood, an Islamist government that uh, would attempt to roll back many of the social changes that the king has made. If they were replaced through violence, then you'd end up with a jihadist regime like ISIS or, the, um, or Al Qaeda. Neither of those groups share our values or our interests. So um, in the final analysis, um, I think what we have to do is uh, recognize that the king has made social and cultural and economic changes, that he remains popular, uh, that if we disengage, the um, Chinese and the Russians would be more than happy to take our place, and they do not share our interests or our values either. So in the end, I think um, we need to look to the future, uh, not the past. We need to protect both our values and our interests, and we need to remain engaged with the Saudis while telling them that what they did was unacceptable and needs to be stopped, and that at the same time encouraging the positive reforms that are ongoing. So I think that was a answer that answers question. Somewhat. So let me let me take this one more step then. You write, vast oil reserves have created an unconventional economy that's more distributive than productive and provides the population with a living standard totally divorced from their actual productivity. Limits True. to price of oil and the volume of oil exports have made the kingdom's oil-funded distributive economy unsustainable. MBS has been wounded by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Yes. At the same time, he's a man in a hurry. He has to, has to transform the country to survive. Um, does this cloud that hangs over him and the one that he's creating again with mm -hmm. M M uh, uh, you know, uh, Mohammed bin Nayef and, and Saad al Jabi, do these clouds hurt him in moving this economy as fast as he as fast as he needs to. Yes, I mean that, that I can answer that question very definitely. Clear, it's yes. These have not helped him. The truth, I think, is that we should want Mohammed bin Salman and his vision to succeed. Uh, what he's trying to do for Saudi Arabia, if you read Vision 2030, it's a very positive plan. It was written largely by Western consultants. Um, it's trying to move Saudi Arabia to be a more productive economy, a sustainable economy an economy that's not so dependent on oil, a country that is more tolerant and socially uh, progressive, uh, which they have a long ways to go in that respect, but they're moving in the right direction. So I think we should want him to succeed. And you're right that what he's doing, uh, what he did with Jamal Khashoggi and what he's now having this problem with, um, you know, I don't know for a fact what's happened to um, Saad al Jabri. Well, he's in Canada, but what's happened to Mohammed bin Nayef, they say that he's under house arrest. I don't know whether that's true or not. I certainly know people who have seen him in the last few months out and about at um, various family events. So what kind of detention he's in, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, I, and we probably should um, find that out before we jump to conclusions. But um, clearly the, the, the publicity is not helpful. I'd agree. But we, he, ought to have, he ought to get more attuned to this. But we gonna... Saad El Jabri's children are being held hostage in Saudi Arabia. Um, and he is, is being pressured. No, you know, nobody has been um, chopped up in an embassy. That is correct. Uh, but the pressure is, is enormous. And Mohammed bin Nayef has been stripped of every ounce of power and, and, and money 
um, that he, he has. It's, it's, it's instructive about how Mohammed bin Salman deals with any kind of dissent. I think that's true. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the, the social and economic changes which have taken place. Um, on the one hand, there have been no political changes. It was a monarchy, it remains a monarchy. But you have to remember that there actually have been very large and profound political changes in Saudi Arabia in that we are moving from generation two to generation three. Since 1960, basically, the, there has been a very smooth succession of the crown from one brother to another brother to another brother. Uh, and this has contributed significantly to the legitimacy of the monarchy in that unlike most Arab governments, they have a mechanism for smoothly and peacefully and quickly transferring political power. Um, people say the king ended this system. Well, he didn't really end it. It ended itself. Uh, there was a, the end of the brothers. And so there was going to be this change to the third generation, which even people like me who, have, who, who thought Saudi Arabia was more stable than most people did for a long time, recognized that this transition to the third generation was going to be messy. It had, it had a real potential to destabilize the country. And the king uh, engineered the rise of NBS in order to prevent that. And in doing that, there were inevitably going to be a lot of noses that were bent out of shape. Uh, there were a lot of, there were, you know, there were 34 sons, there were over 500 grandsons. All of those grandsons thought they should be king. Uh, and they weren't, they could not have the same power or wealth that their fathers had. So there was, it was a diminishing, a, a shrinking, if you will, a narrowing of the cone of, of privilege. Um, and he was quite ruthless in how he did that. Yes, uh, he, but he also at the same time has engineered a system now that it's pretty clear who's going to be the next king. So there's not going to be a Game of Thrones. And I think that that's, that's a very important. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's hard to prove a negative, but it's what didn't happen. It's what they were able to avoid, what the king was able to avoid. And quite frankly, I'm not sure the king could do it again. Uh, you know, if, uh, Tom Friedman wrote once that uh, if you think there's a dozen princes who are as clever and ambitious and ruthless as MBS in Riyadh, you're wrong. And I think that's true. This guy has certain characteristics which make him uh, able to implement this transition. He is his father's son, and you write a great detail. Uh, I, you know, uh, King Salman was the governor of Riyadh, uh, and you write where most Al Saud princes lived. King Fahad had assigned him the role of referee in family disputes and disciplinarian for wayward princes, sometimes referred to as the Prince of Princes. Salman maintained, this is my favorite detail, a private jail for princes, and was well aware of which family members abused the royal status. So it's not unheard of, you know, we all, when we saw uh, Saudi uh, elite being imprisoned um, in a, in a five-star hotel in Riyadh, shocking, new, different. But this detail tells me that, you know, this family has been putting elites in, in jail for a while to have his own private jail. Which for does exist. It does exist. In fact, there's two of them. Um, so, yes, he did put people there. And I will tell you, um, I don't know. I, I am not able to comment on the charges that were made against Mohammed bin Nayef. Um, but I will say that the people that were put in the Ritz, uh, the, the ones that people know about, uh, they, they had been doing things that were, um, by most standards, deemed corrupt. And it's also true that some of those people had done what they were thrown in the Ritz for before Mohammed bin Salman was even born. So this was the king's list, okay? The king, the king Salman ran by Saudi standards, a very clean operation in Riyadh. When he was governor of Riyadh, he would go to the Riyadh Development Authority and he would say to people, if I catch any of you embezzling, you will go to jail for the rest of your life. And that was not the way the rest of the Saudi government operated. So he has recognized that corruption is a, um, is a drawback, a detriment to the nation's development for a long time. And he's been trying to 
when he was governor of Riyadh, he did it to the extent he was able, but he couldn't control his older brothers. Now he's the king and he's, and he's trying to clean things up. And, he's, and you know, if you wanted to talk about something that's really changed in Saudi Arabia, this corruption um, has declined. And you talk to Saudi businessmen and they will tell you that there's less, less corruption, less people asking them for bribes. There's now a way that you can report it anonymously. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a serious change and a good change. Uh, whether or not uh, it's being used as a trumped up charge against the two people you've talked about, I am not in a position to say. Uh, but I would say that most of the people that went in the Ritz were no threat to the crown prince or the king. So I would, I would just leave, leave it at that to say that the people who say that this was entirely a power grab are mistaken. That the, the people that were put in the Ritz were not a threat. Uh, the power had already been seized. Let me ask one question that has always bothered me, and that is the women activists that are still in jail. They are such a non-threat to him. He could make points in Congress if he released them, no matter what they said. And, and they will say bad things, no doubt. I was tortured, no doubt. But MBS has been impervious to any uh, argument that this is no threat to you. These are women who simply wanted to drive. And by the way, you, you let people drive now. Why do you think he's been so insistent on not letting those women out of jail? I think he believes that they have been doing more than just protesting about women driving. I mean, I think that's what he believes. Because I agree with you. To, to keep them in jail just for women because they were activists just seems pretty witless. So either, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, uh, either he is witless on, in, and tone deaf to foreign um, opinions, or he believes that these people did something beyond what the Western press claims they're in jail for. And specifically, um, supporting anti-government uh, regimes. We've talked before this thing started. There are people who want to overthrow the government in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, there are people who want to use violence to overthrow the government in Saudi Arabia. And there are foreign countries that have quietly supported them. And uh, some of those people in jail, and I can't speak with authority about whether these women activists are in that group, but there are certainly people in jail who, you know, everybody who gets thrown in jail says they're thrown in jail because they are human rights activists. Um, that's sometimes true, but not always. And some of them are in there. And some of them are human rights activists who did something else as well. So I don't know which it is in the case of these ladies, but I do know that for some of those people, they did more than just uh, protest about human rights. Although I've known most of them for the last 15 years, so it's, it's hard for me to take that the on. Ladies, like I say, I don't know about the ladies. I, I, I don't know about them. Yeah. Look, uh, me, hopefully, hopefully he's listening tonight and decides to let them out. That would be great. Um, let me ask you, go back to something that you said earlier, and that is the, that Corona is, is affecting the economy. I mean, Saudi Arabia has had some experience with how to deal with the pandemic. They had their own. They had, they had SARS. Um, and they didn't do very well then. One would think that that was a learning curve for them. Um, why is it affecting the economy? And... You, do you think they will be able to get a hold on it? They, I mean, they have some events, some religious events that will challenge them as much as they challenge us. You know, what? We can't go to church? How is that possible? Um, and they're going to have the same problem. Why can they not? What, why is it costing them? And, and can they get uh, their arms around this? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure I would... Um completely agree that they didn't do anything or that they were, that they failed. I would, I, my, my take on this is nobody, um, and I'm no epidemiolo epidemiologist or public health official, but I look at the numbers and I don't see any country that gets an A plus. Okay. No, I'm saying that they didn't do well I, over MERS, that, that when oh, MERS happened, that, that's, that's when, that was their, so they were a bit, you know, caught off guard and, but they had, they have experience. They have more experience than other countries. I would say that they, they acted pretty decisively. Um, I would say that for them to shut down the Hajj, to shut down Mecca, those were pretty big steps and they closed their borders. Um, they just opened it yesterday and people still can't leave. So I would say that if you look at terms of lockdown, the Saudis have been on the um, more locked down side rather than the more lenient side. I, I started to say that I'm not sure anybody has got it right. The people who locked down early are now having it coming up and the people who didn't lock down are in it. So I think there's, to, to me, there's a certain reversion to the mean that this is going to happen regardless of what you do in the, with this. That's my own take on it. But I think that, I don't think the Saudis were negligent. I think that they, I think closing the Hajj and shutting down Mecca 
were big deals. And I think they actually should get some credit for that. And do they take an economic hit for that? Yes, they did. A big economic hit. Uh, they did. They, they, a lot of people, um, now that like the United States, I think they handed out money. They, they had programs to um, compensate people. But yes, the, the pilgrims bring money and they spend money. And, and more to the point, what they had done in the past, this was a big part of Vision 2030. This is why Vision 2030 has been s slowed down. I wouldn't say it's been derailed, but it's certainly been slowed down because promoting tourism was one of the key platforms, one of the key planks that they were trying to uh, develop. And now that's been blown out of the water. So yes, it was, it was very painful for them. But I don't think that they did a particularly worse job than a lot of other people. In fact, as I say, I think they deserve some credit for what they did, which was not easy. For the custodian of the two holy mosques to shut down Mecca, that's a pretty big step. Let me ask you about Saudi-U.S. relations. I, I don't know if the Saudis, you know, since well, uh, the beginning of the relationship has, has been so close to power in Washington. Um, you know, MBS and Jared Kushner on, are on uh, uh, WhatsApp together, on speed dial. Um, President Trump, that was his first official visit to Saudi Arabia. That was really surprising to watch that happen. Um, and, you know, the U.S. has, has changed all the rules for um, selling uh, weapons to the Saudis. Um, I, I wonder if you think that they are unsettled by the possibility uh, that the election this time doesn't go their way, that they're going to have to deal with the Democrats again, um, and that is unsettling to them. Yes, I think it is. I think it is unsettling. They have a good relationship with the current administration, and they would like to see that continue. That said, um, I've watched the Saudi-American relationship for over 40 years, and it is cyclical. It, it goes up and down and up and down, and there are good times and bad times. There are many events which people say, that's it, it's over. I mean, the oil embargo in 73, people don't focus on it, but when they went and bought ballistic missiles from China, that was, people said, you gotta be kidding, we can't deal with these guys, we can't sell them anything anymore when we had 9-11. Uh, so there have been many instances when the relationship went into free fall, um, and it always came back. And why did it come back? Because as I said earlier, we don't, you don't, countries don't have friends, they have interests. And our interests and theirs have in many cases been aligned. And uh, they certainly were aligned during the Cold War when the Saudis were really the only Arab country, the only Arab country that throughout the entire Cold War never flinched in its support for the West and the United States. Every other Arab country uh, at one point or another was um, a pal of the Russians, uh, possibly Jordan is the other example that didn't, but pretty much everybody else was at one point or another. So they have been a, an ally for a long time, or a partner if you don't want to, they're not an official ally, but a friend and a partner for a long time. And I think that, uh, and this would, I, I would bet that this is the case, that um, if we have a President Biden, uh, he may not like the Saudis. He may for the first year um, distance himself from the Saudis. Uh, I don't think President Obama ever really liked the Saudis, but he went to Saudi Arabia more than any other president had ever done. And he broke off an important trip to India to go to King uh, Abdullah's uh, funeral. And there were no less than three secretaries of state at that funeral to represent all of the previous administrations, or not all of them, but many of them. In fact, I guess there were four of them all together and counting three who were former secretaries of state. So that reflects a depth of relationship that goes beyond Republican or Democrat. Uh, and I think that will continue uh, regardless of who wins the election. As I said, because we have an interest in producing, in the production of oil in a predictable and stable manner, which the Saudis do uh, without, the, and, and I, I just comment on that just briefly, because I think people want to know about that. Um, and this is really the heart of why the Saudi-American relationship will continue. The Saudis are the only country, and they, they produce a lot of oil. They produce a lot of oil cheaply. But there are other countries that can do that as well. What they do, which nobody else does, is they maintain a buffer. They maintain a, usually about 2 million barrels a day of surplus capacity. That is what makes them valuable. They are the Federal Reserve, the central bank of oil for the planet. So when, and no one else will do that because it's a political decision 
not an economic decision. If the president of Exxon spent $50 billion, which is what it cost them, to drill these wells and then to shut them in and said, we're just going to keep them there until for a rainy day, uh, he would be looking for a new job. So, but the, but the Saudis do that at considerable cost, very significant cost. Uh, and then when there's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, when there's a strike in Venezuela, or quite frankly, when the United States decides that we want to put sanctions on somebody, uh, and then all of a sudden the oil, the, the oil price would go through the roof, except no, the Saudis turn on the tap and uh, the price stays relatively stable. They don't control it completely, but they have an ability to manage uh, oil prices and they do that and this is the last point i'll make is it be, not because they like us but because their interest and ours are aligned they want to see oil used as a major part of global energy for a long time they have a lot of oil and they want to continue to keep it in the energy mix and they understand that if prices are too volatile or prices are too high then um that won't be the case. If prices, they don't like too high prices. People would be surprised to know that. But the Saudis think if prices get too high, then everybody's going to get an electric car. They're going to put the third layer of insulation on their window. They're going to start drilling for oil in very expensive places like the Arctic or the deep shore of Brazil. So they don't want people to do that. They want people to buy their cheap oil for a long time. So they have an interest, which is similar to ours. And um, it's not clear that a government after Saudi, after, if a new government in, the, in Saudi Arabia would be able to do that. Um, the Shah of Iran produced six million barrels a day, almost seven. Uh, the Iranians today would be lucky to produce three. That's what, 40 years later, they still, they, all their, their industry has collapsed. Uh, so it's this, Aramco does a good job of uh, managing the Saudi oil supplies. And I think that uh, we would like to see that continue. So the answer is, I think that the relationship will remain strong regardless of who becomes president though the window dressing may change a bit. So it took a long time to answer that, but it's an let, important question. Let me ask one more question about the, the oil. I, I mean, it, it makes me think that oil is still important, not in the way it used to be, because we now are a major producer ourselves, the United States. Um, how do you explain then this weird war that the Saudis got into with the Russians? It, I, I, even President Trump was like, please don't do this. Uh, this is not helping anybody. Is that another case of the impetuousness of MBS, or was there a strategic reason for the two of them to fight over this? Well, um, there are a couple questions. There are a couple, couple points there. I think the first point is that while the supply curve for global energy has changed because of the fracking revolution in the United States, and the price of oil is not going to be $100 a barrel anytime in the near future. Saudi production does affect the global price of oil. Oil is traded on a global market. So unless the United States is going to put a ban on the export of American oil, which wouldn't go down terribly well with a lot of people, uh, we'll pay the global price or adjusted to some extent for transport costs. But basically, the, global, the energy is at a global price. Uh, so we, there is more of it now, but uh, the Saudi production is still important. Um, the Saudis tried in the 80s to keep oil prices high by cutting their production dramatically. They cut it from something like 10 million barrels a day to two in order to keep the price high in the mid 80s. And all they did was watch everybody else cheat and reap, reap the benefits of their losses. And in the end, uh, the king fired the oil minister and reversed course. And they concluded that they would never again do that, that they would never again uh, hold the can for everybody else. And that includes the Russians. Uh, so they had negotiated, and this was actually, you know, this was actually quite a success that um, really MBS and Khalid Al-Fala, the former petroleum minister, that they got the Russians on board to create this thing called OPEC Plus, which at first was informal, but then it actually became a formal agreement. And what they disagreed upon was um, that they would increase the cuts. The Russians agreed to keep the level at it. They had reduced the production and the Russians said, we'll keep it at the reduced production. And the Saudis said, no, we need to cut it even more. And the Russians didn't do that. Uh, and so the Saudis, um, 
increase production to make the price go down. Um, and they did start a little war with the Russians. Now, um, and I think they did that for precisely the reason that I explained that they had said that they would never again be the ones who were discarrying the can for everybody else. They wanted to make that point. As they had made to people in OPEC, they wanted to make that point to the Russians. Now, um, just to carry the story a little bit further, uh, their timing was way off in that they, they didn't anticipate that oil prices would collapse because of COVID. Uh, they did this just really the month before COVID. If they'd waited another month, the oil price would have collapsed in any event, and there wouldn't have been much they could have done about it. Um, but uh, they did, they did um, have a tit, a tit for tat with the Russians, yes, and I think the reason was that they wanted to make it clear that they were not going to be the fall guy for everybody else. I'm going to take a question now from Thomas Tisch, and he writes, Mecca is closed to the outside world, a unique situation in the world. How should we interpret this aspect of Saudi Islam exclusivity? And we don't want you here or close to us messaging. And let me ask this question in the context of the Saudis are opening up to tourism. I've always wanted to go to Mecca, but I couldn't um, as a, as a non-Muslim. Um, is there a moment that they, they let people who are not Muslims come to one of the most historic sites in the world? Um, and if they're going to open for tourism, why not let us go to Mecca? That's a good question. Um, there would be um, opposition to that. There would be people who would be angry. Uh, there could be violence. And I think it's an issue that they just don't want to go there. Um, I had the similar discussion with the Saudi foreign minister more than once about why, if you're preaching tolerance now, why don't you let us have a church in, uh, in Riyadh? Um, I think that's actually a more pressing question than whether I get to go to Mecca, whether I get to have a church in Riyadh. And the foreign minister was very clear. He said, look, and, and I think this is well known, that if you practice your religion in your house quietly and you have less than 100 people, they aren't going to bother you. You can't go out and stand in a field and have a prayer meeting, but religious, Christian and other type religion, religions do have meetings in, in Riyadh. They just don't build a big church. And the foreign minister was very clear. He said, look, if I build a church for you, you're, I'm going to have to station police around it 24 hours a day because somebody's going to come and try and burn it down or blow it up. And they might try and do it while you're inside, as they did in Pakistan uh, more than once. So he just said, look, this is a red flag in front of a bull and we don't need to do it. Uh, and I think that that probably is a prudent decision. Uh, I think what they do now is kind of wink and a nod and uh, you get on with it. And, uh, and, but I don't, I don't think they're going to, no, I don't think they're going to be Western tourists going to Mecca, uh, not, in the, not in the near future, no. So I think in time, yes, I think in time it will happen, but I don't think it's happening today or tomorrow. So Mecca becomes the Vatican at some moment in history. I mean, anybody. I would, anybody. I, would th I would think that's probably true. I would think that's probably true at some point in time. Although, you know, there is, a, there is a statement in the Quran about how there's not supposed to be anybody but Muslims in the Arabian Peninsula. So that, you know, the problem, this, is, this relates to a different problem that they have with um, all of their religious law, is that if it says it in the Quran, uh, it's very difficult to change it. Uh, you know, this is supposedly the word of God. So if God said this, uh, no elected parliament or no king can just say, well, that was yesterday and I'm changing the rules. So some things are, are hard for them to change. Uh, and that includes, you know, things like uh, women's share of inheritance, which is specified in the Quran. It was what it was specified as at the time was very liberal and progressive, that women would get half of what a man got because before that they got nothing. So when Muhammad revealed this, it was considered very progressive. Now, 1,400 years later, it's kind of regressive, but it's hard to change. And I think the foreigners going to Mecca will fall under that category. So I, I, don't, think it, I don't think it's a big deal. I, I think that letting people have a church in Riyadh or a church in Jeddah would be more important than letting me go to Mecca. Or more likely Dahran, if there's going to be a or church. Dahran, yeah, if they let you build a church in Dahran, that's right. Let, let me ask a couple of regional for that matter. I mean, a synagogue or a Buddhist temple. Ever. It's not. Yeah, uh, but probably. Yeah, you're right. 
uh, Riyadh's in the middle of the uh, uh, of Nejd, and that's uh, it's unlikely. Um, I want to ask a couple of regional questions. Um, Yemen has always been a puzzle to me. Um, I, th the Saudis are getting nothing out of this war uh, at this point, um, except a black eye. Um, and I wondered why it's been so difficult to bring it to a close. The UAE is like, we're done. We're, we're not doing this anymore. Um, but the Saudis are still at it and, you know, it's not resolved. Um, and I wondered why you think it's so hard for them to let that go. You know, um, let me answer that by giving you a couple analogies with American foreign policy. The United States was not willing to see the Soviet Union put missiles in Cuba 90 miles off our coast. And we were close to going to war with the Soviet Union to stop that. And the Saudis were not willing to allow Iran to establish a foothold on the Arabian Peninsula and put missiles in Yemen, which they have in fact been able to do now, but uh, they thought that was something that they should try to stop. So that's how they got into it. I think it's clear you need to understand that the Houthis are not totally the agents of the Iranians. They don't, they don't take all their orders from the Iranians. They have their own legitimate uh, gripes, grievances, agenda, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they do take money and, and training and influence. They are influenced by the Iranians. And so, and there are Iranian advisors that have been with them there. So the um, Saudis were, didn't want to see that. So that's how it got started. Um, I think again, like the United States in Afghanistan, the Saudis didn't, we didn't expect to be in Afghanistan 20 years later, and they didn't expect to be in Yemen uh, five years later. So they got into a quagmire, so did we. And now I guess the third analogy I would draw would be to Vietnam, where we realized that after a while that we were not gonna win militarily at a cost that we were willing to pay. And the Saudis have gotten to that point as well. But extricating yourself uh, is not easy when the other guy knows you're trying to get out. And I think uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger would probably have something to say about that and how he had to negotiate with the um, North Vietnamese. So, um, you know, they're trying to get out. I think they'd like to get out. They'd like to find a way that they can get out but preserve their security interests. And those security interests are to them a lot more serious than ours were in Vietnam. Uh, we, the Vietnam was a long ways away. Yemen is, is their border. So they, they still have legitimate security concerns which they're trying to find a negotiated, system, situ, uh, negotiated way to resolve. Uh, it's not easy. I would say that it's not, it's, the war is not popular in Saudi Arabia, but it's not as destabilizing as the, as the Vietnam War is in the United States. You know, you're not seeing people marching around with signs saying, end the war. People are upset primarily because it costs a lot of money at a time when the government is uh, going broke, basically was going broke and uh, is still not uh, flush with money and that that affects the money that the government has to spend on other projects for the people. So real concern is the cost of the war. Although I and point out it's another black eye. Again, we, we keep coming back to this uh, public relations, uh, um, what would you call it, uh, malpractice, I guess. They're, 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 they, they certainly don't seem to have a very good grip on that. I would agree with you there. But does Yemen, is Yemen part of a larger than regional question? Is there, do you see any way for the Saudis and the Iranians to come to better terms? I mean, it's been... Uh, almost impossible uh, during the Trump administration because uh, this administration stands against the Iranians no matter what the Saudis are doing. Um, it makes it easy to not address the conflict or find a way out of this conflict. Is there a way out of the conflict between the Saudis and Iran? Or, or is the bigger problem, as the foreign minister once said in a talk, we're just too big. Iran is too big for the region, and that's why they're all mad at us. Um, but is there a way out between the Saudis and the Iranians? Not that I know of. Um, no, I don't want to sound overly pessimistic, but to me, I'm, I'm not an expert on Iran, but what I see is going to happen in Iran is that they are evolving into a, effectively a police state, a military 
dictatorship. I think once this, um, once Hamani dies, the, the Revolutionary Guard will effectively take over that country. They're already starting to do that. Revolutionary Guard are, um, are a radical bunch and they want to export their revolution uh, and exporting their revolution is part of their ideology. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't think that they're going to back off anytime soon and try and become, I mean, the Obama administration went way out of their way. And, and I'm one who doesn't criticize them for doing that. Um, they tried very hard, very hard to make, uh, to open the door for the Iranians and to say, look, come and join the rest of the world. Yeah, you've seen the pictures. They sent them literally plane loads of money. They took off sanctions. And did, did the Iranians say, thanks, now we're gonna be normal and friendly? No, they didn't. They kept creating havoc in a lot of countries with this foreign legion of proxy fighters, which they've created. So, um, and when the Revolutionary Guard take over Iran, which I think they will, as I said, um, I don't think it's gonna get any better. So, uh, and I don't, and like I said, I don't, you know, Obama took a bet um, and he might've been right. You know, I've, I often think about that. People say, you know, he sold out like, like Chamberlain did at Munich. Well, you know, nobody really knew at, at the time. What was Adolf Hitler going to say, okay, thanks, I got Sudetenland, that's enough. And, you know, and if, if he had done that, nobody would have ever heard of Winston Churchill. Uh, Winston Churchill would have been a forgotten figure. And, and, and how could you know for certain, for 100%, that Hitler wasn't going to keep his word. So I think Obama took a chance, just like Neville Chamberlain did. And uh, I don't think he was, I think he was like Neville Chamberlain. He was tricked or deceived or whatever. Um, I don't, but I don't fault him for trying. So the answer is not, no, I don't think the Iranians are likely to come around. In fact, if anything, I think they're going to get worse because as I say, the, what's going to come next is not a religious regime, but really just a, a police state. But that then raises a very serious question. And this also includes what happens ultimately in Iran. You have a region that is dependent on oil for its very survival. And they're all, all the Gulf states certainly are trying this, some version of Vision 2030. Yes, that's right. And so, and they must succeed. They, they, there, there's no room for error, right? They, they all have to change their economic model to make it for the next 50 years. If this Iranian-Saudi uh, competition continues, how much does that slow down the transition or derail the transition? Well, I would, I would say two things. Um, the first is that they are not going to totally transform their economy, not by 2030 and not by 2050. That's not going to happen they will remain heavily dependent on exporting mineral resources for the rest of my life. Uh, but there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Australia and Canada are both heavily dependent on exports of raw materials, but they will have to reduce it. And I think that's doable. So it's not that they're gonna become, you know, this Hong Kong or Singapore of the, of the Middle East, um, but they, they, then they don't have to be because they're always gonna have oil and people are gonna keep buying oil and it, the price may not be what it was, but they're gonna be able to survive uh, by adjusting, not totally redoing their economy. Um, do I think that the, that's an interesting question. I mean, clearly peace in this part of the world would help, uh, would reduce their defense expenditures dramatically. It would allow them to focus. Um, and, that, and, and the fact that they wanna make peace with Israel, I think reflects that. They are tired of wars. Wars cost money and they don't produce much that's of any use to anybody. So if they could, I think the Saudis would make peace with the Iranians if the Iranians would make peace with them. Uh, and I think they've said that. And I think that they, have tried in the past. But I, I think that, you know, people have been looking for these so-called Iranian moderates for a long time, and I haven't found them. And I've, many times people say, oh, now there's this Iranian moderate, and they're gonna get elected, and they're gonna win the election, and nothing really changes. Um, so I'm, I say, there are probably people on this Zoom who know more about Iran than I do, but I don't see them um, becoming a more amenable to a friendly relationship in the near future. Although I think the Saudis would like to, and I think that it would help their economy if they did. And I think, as I said, that's one of the reasons why they're trying to become more friendly with Israel. David Rundell, I thank you so much. I enjoyed your book. I enjoyed this talk. Um, we can see it right behind you. Um, Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at
crossroads and you have made a very good uh, I'll show you the book. there you go there's the book uh, it's got the picture of i have to tell you that mohammed bin salman is on the cover but he features in only one of he features in three out of 20 chapters so the cover is a little misleading it's about a lot more than just mohammed bin salman Loved all the history. And I'm going to turn this back over to Carla Thorson. Thanks for letting us talk for an hour. We, we would have done it even if there wasn't a Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. I'd like to do it again. Are you in Washington usually? No, I'm in Princeton, New Jersey. But okay. well, well, I come there sometimes. Good. Great. Come and see me. Carla I Thorson, would. it's up to you. Thank you both so much, Deb Amos and, and David Rundell. And uh, it's a, a wonder of technology that we are able to talk with you in Princeton, me in San Francisco, and David, you're in Dubai, correct? I am indeed. So we're all over the world. Um, and thank you to everyone else who was able to join this, this talk today. And it really was an incredibly rich conversation on a very important issue for the US and for the the world going forward. So appreciate it very much. Um, I do want to take a moment to also just let everybody know about something that uh, World Affairs is delighted to be doing. Uh, next week, we are partnering with HBO to bring you a special pre-screening of the documentary Agents of Chaos, um, which is uh, going to be a really interesting uh, examination of Russia's engage involvement in, uh, in trying to impact our elections. And we'll also have a special conversation with the director, the Emmy Award and Academy Award winning director, Alex Gibney. So look for a communication from us about this next week, um, along with all of the other things that we're planning um, in the lead up to the fall elections. And in the meantime, thank you so much. I hope that the skies are clear wherever you are and uh, that we will see you again soon in this virtual world. Thanks so much. Thank you Thank very much. Good night. Good night.